have your Bible, please turn to Acts chapter 19. Acts chapter 19, we are going to be looking today at being bold for Christ in the world. As we think about students going back to school and teachers starting back into the workplace, as we think about people ending summer and getting back into the swing of things, I thought that this would be an appropriate message for us about the need for us to be on mission for Jesus wherever we are at. And so if you have Acts chapter 19 available, I'd like for you to read with me Acts chapter 19, verse 20. It says, So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that Your word would increase. Lord, that Your Word would prevail. Lord, that You would be in charge of everything and over everything. And Lord, that we would be partners with You on this mission. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. In 1806, in Williamstown, Massachusetts, Samuel Mills, and four other college students gathered together in a grove of trees to talk about the need for foreign missions and the need for people to go and serve as missionaries. While they started that meeting, a thunderstorm came about, and they were out in the middle of a grove of trees, and they sought shelter underneath a haystack. And while they were huddled up together in this haystack, they began praying. They began praying fervently that the Lord would send missionaries to the lost around the world, and they didn't stop praying for several hours. When they came out from under that haystack, they were forever changed. Five college students with a simple goal to pray for missionaries. They did that on 18, in 1806. Years later, they founded the United Foreign Mission Board. And in 1812, they sent their first five missionaries overseas, including Adoniram Judson, to India. After 150 years, that, uh, that mission organization is still going. They have sent in their history over 5,000 missionaries to over 34 countries. Now you go back to those five college students who had a desire to see people know Jesus, and all they could think to do was gather together under a haystack and pray. Church, what would happen if we would gather together, if we would pray, and if we would be bold for Christ in the world? As we are about to enter back into the swing of things, as students are about to get back to school, what would it look like if students went into their schools bold for Christ? What would it look like if teachers went into the workplace bold for Christ? Not doing all kinds of crazy things, not being street preachers, but simply living out their faith in a genuine and real way. It could turn the world upside down. As we are going to see here in this passage in Acts chapter 19, a few Christians who were faithful to Jesus turned this entire city upside down, and I believe God can do the same thing right here in our church, in our community, in our state, and in our nation, if we would just be faithful to the task of proclaiming Jesus. And so if we are to be bold for Christ in this world, there are three things that we need to remember that I think this passage can teach us. The first thing we need to remember is that Jesus is powerful over the enemy. Jesus is powerful over the enemy. Look at verse 11 in Acts chapter 19. It says, And God was doing extraordinary miracles by the hands of Paul, so that even handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were carried away to the sick, and their diseases left them, and all the evil spirits came out of them. God is doing these miracles. God had been doing miracles all throughout the book of Acts. We, we spent a significant amount of time in the book of Acts, and we've seen God do miracles, but this seems to be unique. Whereas Paul is preaching and teaching, and as his skin touches some handkerchief or some cloth, then it is taken, and it brings healing to other people. Now, some people will take this out of context, 
and you will see preachers on TV anointing handkerchiefs, anointing oil, praying over it, and selling it to you for a profit. I don't think that that's what the Scripture is teaching because the glory does not rest on the handkerchief and the glory does not rest on Paul, but the glory rests on God alone doing these miracles. And in this time and this place, the people of Ephesus, where they are at, were very superstitious. Superstitious. They believed in sorcery and magic. way to show them that Jesus had power over all things and that the name of Jesus was powerful. And so you have these things happening. Then look at verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by Jesus whom Paul proclaimed. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Sheba were doing these things. And so you have these people, and they call them here Jewish exorcists, but what they really were were these people who claimed to be able to speak to the dead, to speak to evil spirits, and they would conjure up these incantations, and they would say all of these things in order to cast these demons out. And they did so for a profit. And people believed in them, and they were thought well of in this community. And the reason it says that they were uh, kin to the Jewish high priest, most scholars don't believe that they were actually part of a Jewish priestly family, but rather that they just gave themselves that title because the Hebrew name had different, the Hebrew language had different names for God. And so they would call upon the God in Hebrew languages. They would call upon other gods. They would call upon any name they could think of if they thought that it would help them out. And so here, they hear about Jesus and the power of Jesus, and so they say, you know what? We'll just start calling on the name of Jesus. We have this man who is possessed by a demon, and so we're going to call on the name of Jesus to get him out. Look at how that works out for these people in verse 15. It says, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know and Paul I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastered all of them, and overpowered them. So they fled out of the house naked and wounded. I'll tell you, I don't know much about fights. I got a crash course in fights with uh, church softball this year. They tried to educate me on the uh, church softball team. I don't know much about fights, but I do know this. If you leave a fight and you're naked, you lost. (laughs) I mean... You've got to love the, the imagery here in the Bible, right? I mean, these guys come up and they say, we're going to cast this demon out. And this man overpowers them, beats them, and they don't just leave. They leave naked. That's bad. That is really bad right there. These men thought that they could speak the name of Jesus. They thought that they could proclaim the name of Jesus, and it would be like saying any other incantation or spell. But they didn't realize the power that the name of Jesus held. And they didn't realize that if they didn't confess and repent and believe and trust in Jesus, then they had no authority to call on the name of Jesus. But church, you and I here today, we have the authority to call on the name of Jesus. If we have believed in Him, if we have put our trust in Him, then He is powerful. His name is powerful, and He can help us in this world. Too often times, if we want to be bold for Christ in the world, we walk around and we are complaining. We are worried about the state of our country. We are worried about the state of the world. And the image that we portray to the world is that we are defeated. I don't know how we're going to go on. I don't know how this is going to happen. I don't know what's going to, what's going to occur. And we're wringing our hands and we're worried. How is that attractive to someone who is considering being a Christian? Instead, what we should be is confident. Confident in Jesus and His power over the enemy. Knowing that no matter what happens, Jesus is in control. No matter what the world throws at us, Jesus has power over these enemies in this life. And so if we are to be bold for Christ in the world, we need to remember the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus to defeat any enemy that we have. And we need to live in victory. Showing the world the victory that we do have in Jesus Christ. So we need to remember that Jesus is powerful over the enemy. Second, we need to remember that Jesus can deliver us from bondage. Jesus can deliver us from bondage. Look at verse 17. And this became known to all the residents of Ephesus, 
both Jews and Greeks, and fear fell upon them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was extolled. And many of those who were now believers came, confessing and divulging their practices. And a number of those who had practiced magic arts brought their books together, and they burned them in the sight of all. And they counted the value of them and found it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. So the word of the Lord continued to increase and prevail mightily. Here we see that Jesus completely changes this group of people. It's amazing how Jesus completely transforms these Jewish exorcists, these magicians, all these people going around. He completely changes their life. There's a few things that kind of happen in this progression. In verse 17, it says that the first thing is that fear fell upon them. It's interesting that fear falls upon them. I mean, if you see uh, your friend get whooped up on like they did, I guess they would be afraid. But it's more of a fear of God. Remember, we just went through Proverbs. And what does Proverbs chapter 1, verse 7 say? The fear of the Lord is what? The beginning of wisdom. Right? They were fearful because they knew that there was a God in heaven and they were not. They were fearful because they knew that God was over and above all things and they themselves were mere humans. And so where did this lead them? Look at verse 7. Lord Jesus was exposed. Because they saw Jesus in His power, they feared Him, but then it led to worship. There are things in this life that I fear, but I don't always worship them. Worship comes when we realize who God is and who we are. We realize His greatness, the magnitude of our God who could create all people and hold the entire world in His hands. And then who are we compared to Him? Who are we that He would offer us grace and mercy and love? This led them to worship. And it should lead us to worship. And then finally, the third part of this stage, they feared, then they worshipped, and then what? Verse 18, many of those who were now believers came confessing and divulging their practices. They changed. had value because they could recite them over and over and they had power in these books. And after they met Jesus, what did they do with those books? They burned them. They burned them publicly in front of everyone. Now, I guess they could have taken those books and they could have just put them in a drawer somewhere and said, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to do that anymore, but I'm just going to put this book over here. They could have stashed it away in their closet and said, you know what, I'm not going to live that way and I'm just going to put these things over here. But what they did was they made a clean break with their sin. Too often, I think we can't be bold for Jesus in this world because we have not made a clean break with our sin. We like to keep our sin in the closet or in a drawer where we can get to it easily if we need it. We don't want to put it away entirely. But let me tell you this, if the world is watching, then you know what that looks like to them? Hypocrites. It looks like people who aren't fully committed to Jesus. It looks like people who would rather choose their sin and value their sin rather than valuing Jesus. And if we are going to be bold for Christ, we have to be free from our sin. And only Jesus can do that from us. These people, they burned publicly all of their books. And it says in verse 19, they counted the value of them and it came to 50,000 pieces of silver. That would be the equivalent in that day of the total salaries of 150 men working for one year. It wasn't a small amount. But they said, you know what? Jesus is worth it. Those songs that we've been singing, He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of my life. And He's worthy of me leaving behind my old life that doesn't honor Him, that doesn't show Him glory. And when we choose to live that way, that's attractive to people. They say, I want that because I've seen too many hypocrites. I've seen too many Christians who claim one thing with their mouth and I see something different with their actions. But if we would say, no, Jesus is worth it. I'm going to make a clean break and I'm going to follow Him fully. That is attractive to the law. 
We are all struggling with something. As sinners, we're all imperfect, but I ask you today, give it to Jesus. He can free you from your sins. If you would confess Him, that you would fear Him, that you would worship Him, He would help you turn from your sin and live a life of genuine faith in front of the world. So if we are to be bold for Christ, we need to remember that Jesus is powerful, that He can deliver us from bondage, and finally, that Jesus can transform our community. Jesus can transform our community. Look at verse 23. After all this has happened, then we get to verse 23. It says, About that time, there arose no little disturbance concerning the way. The way would be uh, how they described these early Christians. They called them the way. And they said, uh, there's no little disturbance, meaning they're causing a big stir. Right? That's basically what they're saying. And for the next 20 verses, they tell this story. And I want to share this story with you, and then I want to have two points of application as we close. There was this man named Demetrius in this city of Ephesus, and he was a silversmith. And what he did, he would make these silver idols of the god or the goddess Artemis. Now, Artemis to Ephesus was a pretty big deal. The, the Ephesians believed in this legend where a stone had fallen out of the sky, it had landed in Ephesus, and now they were the gatekeepers to the temple of the goddess of Artemis. And so to be Ephesian, to be an Ephesian is to worship Artemis. And many people would come from all over and they would come to Ephesus in order to worship Artemis. It would be like how New York City is known for the Statue of Liberty, right? Or St. Louis is known for the Ark. Or Belton is known for the Sandpiper, right? They were known for that. And so you have Demetrius and he's a silversmith and he's making these idols. But Demetrius is upset because he sees the stock price of his business going down. He says, there are so many people turning to Jesus that I can hardly sell these idols to you. That's an amazing statement. In this large city, so many people have believed in Jesus. They've convinced other people to believe in Jesus that the people who are selling gods to Artemis are losing money. And so Demetrius goes and he uh, stirs up this crowd. He gets every, all the other silversmiths, he gets all these people upset, and they form this riot, basically. And they go into this big amphitheater, and it says, For two hours they shouted, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. And they were shouting and carrying on until eventually a public official came, and he said, You are, in, you are about to be charged with rioting. The Christians have done nothing wrong. They are just living their lives. You need to be on your way. And they all disperse. Now what can we gather from this story that Paul paints for us here in Acts chapter 19? The first thing is that the life of ordinary Christians convinced people to worship Jesus and not Artemis. The life of ordinary Christians convinced people to worship Jesus and not Artemis. Look at verse 26. This is Demetrius talking. He says, And you see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, this Paul has persuaded and turned away a great many people, saying that gods made with hands are not gods. Verse 27, And there is danger, not only in this trade of ours, that it may come into disrepute, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be counted as nothing, and that she may may even be disposed from her magnificence, she whom all Asia and the world worship. Now, Demetrius is upset because all of a sudden people are coming to him and they say, you made that God with your hands, so why would I worship him when I could worship Jesus? And it's amazing, he points out Paul here, but the amount of people that it would take to decrease his business could not have been reached by Paul alone. Paul was the face of this movement, But what it took was regular, ordinary Christians loving Jesus. And as they loved Jesus, it caused people to turn away from Artemis. Could you imagine being a fly on the wall in one of these conversations? Imagine a group of women who are working together. And they all take a break to go worship this Greek goddess, Artemis. And one of them says, you know what? I used to pray to Artemis. And uh, nothing really changed in my life. 
she's been made by this silversmith Demetrius to know what I started saying to Jesus and he changed my life. And people started turning and following Jesus. Church, this is how it happens. You don't have to be a Billy Graham. You don't have to be a street preacher. You don't have to have the gift of evangelism. You just have to be available to people and to proclaim Jesus when you have an opportunity. We have a world, a culture that celebrates idol worship. They don't worship little idols that they put on a shelf, but they worship themselves. They worship celebrities, sports figures. They worship chasing after He's repaired my relationships with my family. He's given me hope for the future. He's given me joy that I can't explain. And if you can do that, that is real, genuine faith that attracts non-believers to Christianity. Christianity. And another thing, the Christians, they weren't shoving it down people's throats. They weren't coming with their Bible and hitting them over the head with it and saying, you need to be in church and you need to do this and that. No, in fact... He says, the Christians have done nothing wrong. They've just been living their life. So you can't be mad at them. Church, if we here in this room would go out and live genuine lives of faith, it would change our world. So the life of ordinary Christians convinced people to worship Jesus and not Artemis. And second, they were bold for Christ in the midst of opposition. We can be gentle, we can be loving, we can be caring, and guess what? people are still going to be hostile to the message that we have to offer. Because they are not Christians. And the enemy is against Jesus in every way. People are still going to be hostile, but we must be bold for Christ in the midst of that hostility. I love Paul. They had gathered all of these people together. They were marching through the streets. They got to this temple, and they were shouting for two hours, Great is Artemis! And you have in verse 30, Paul. And look at what he says. But but when Paul wished to go in among the crowd, the disciples would not let him. you got to admire the boldness of Paul, right? They have all of these people. There is a riot against Christianity. And Paul says, let me in there. I want to tell them about Jesus. Let me in there. Church, if we had an ounce of the boldness that Paul carried with us, To go in and say, you know what, it might be awkward, it might make things weird, it might be difficult, they might not receive it, but you know what? Jesus is worth it. Jesus is worth it to proclaim His name. Church, we are to be bold for Christ in this world. And if all of us would start with just the people in our life, living genuine life of faith in front of them, it would make a difference and it could transform our community. I'll close with this. Uh, My wife and I were missionaries in India for two years. And while we were there, I had a partner whose name was Solomon. He was an Indian pastor. And he would go around and he would uh, reach out to people in different villages. About 9 o'clock at night, 9.30 at night, he calls me and he says, David, there's this family who is a Hindu family. They aren't Christian. They have all these idols that they worship. He says, but her sister is very sick. The wife of the family. Her sister is very sick. And we need to go and pray for her. I said, Solomon, buddy, it's 9.30 at night. Can we go tomorrow? He says, no, we have to go today. And I I really didn't want to go. Right? I, I was already done for the day. I'm at home. And he says, Pastor, you have to come with me. And so I got in the car and I went over there. We got over there about 9.30, 10 o'clock at night. We see the family, they're all gathered there, this lady's laying in the bed. Me and Solomon go over and we read some scripture with them, we pray with them, and then we go back home. The next day I got a text from Solomon saying that that woman had passed away, she had died. I was sad and I didn't, I prayed for that family, but I didn't think much more about it. Two weeks later, Solomon calls me. I've never heard Solomon this happy in my life. He says, David, do you remember that family we went and prayed for? I said, yes. He said, they want to be Christians now. They want to give their life to Jesus. I said, Solomon, what happened? He said, for the past two weeks, the man 
has been calling him and talking to him. And he says, no one from the temple where we go and worship has hindered you coming. No one came and loved us like you loved us. He says, no one prayed for us like you prayed for us. He said, in fact, for the past two weeks, we've been going to the Hindu temple, and we've been making sacrifices to these gods, and we've been praying to these gods, and it has not brought us any peace. But when you prayed with us that night, it brought us peace and hope. They said, we want Jesus because these idols aren't doing anything for us. Church, Solomon wasn't an Indian billy Graham. He wasn't going around being a street preacher, leading crusades, doing all of these things. But he saw this family in need who was far from God and he loved them. He went faithfully to them and spoke with them and prayed for them over months and months. And then they turned to Jesus. Church, we don't need a lot of extraordinary Christians. We just need some ordinary Christians who are willing to love the people who are right next to them, who are willing to be bold for Christ with the people right in their circle of influence. And if all of us here would go out and do that, we could turn this world upside down for Christ. Would you pray with me? You may be here today and you may not be a Christian. You may not be a follower of Jesus. I want to tell you today that Jesus is worth following. Jesus can give you freedom. He can give you new life and He can transform your family. If you hear, if you are here today and you are a Christian, I challenge you to be bold for Christ in this world. Think of one person who you see on a regular basis who you could share the gospel with. Who you could show, hey, this is how Jesus has changed my life and He can do the same for you. Students, as you are going back to school, think about how you might could be bold for Christ in this world. Teachers, as you are going back into school, be bold for Christ in the world. Father, we need your help. Lord, I pray that you would just make the gospel real to us. That we would celebrate what you have done for us and it would change us. Lord, I pray that we would live differently. Lord, I pray that the world would see it. Lord, that we wouldn't just walk around like hypocrites, saying one thing with our mouth and acting another way. But Lord, I pray that we would be passionate followers of Jesus. And Lord, that you would transform our community right here in Belton, South Carolina. Lord, give us confidence and boldness to go today, knowing that you are in control and in charge of everything. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.